Just what exactly is IndyCar's West Coast Swing? Well, if you haven't been watching IndyCar often this season, or have not been keeping on tabs with what is happening, then the West Coast Swing it might be somewhat alien to you. To be fair, this is alien to more regular watchers of IndyCar as well, considering that this wasn't actually meant to happen at all at the start of the year. But in essence, it's the final three races of this year's championship, which are all taking place on the West Coast of America. However, what on earth can you expect to see on this period of West Coast insanity? Well, this video will quell any fears that you may have had about not having the foggiest clue what is going on in these races. Hopefully. So to kick off, here are the tracks. We begin in Oregon with Portland International Raceway, a track which, for a long time was a mainstay of the IndyCar calendar, took an 11 year hiatus. After that period of hibernation, IndyCar has returned and has since become a firm favourite amongst drivers and fans, with lap times in the race mostly getting under the one minute mark, and good overtaking opportunities. Oh, and Turn 1 is usually known for its, shall we say, problematic starts. Laguna Seca is one of North America's most iconic road courses, so it seems surprising that after 2004, it took until 2019 for it to return to the calendar. Of course, the corkscrew corner is what everybody loves to associate this track with, and for good reason. For what was meant to be the series finale, the track in Monterey will be a suitable penultimate race. Long Beach was meant to take place in April, however it has since been pushed back to become the season finale. After the street course in St. Petersburg last year produced a thrilling season finale, Long Beach will hope to make a similar insane spectacle this year. The only thing that will be certain is the weather. It might be two weeks away, but it's pretty obvious what we're going to get. Now on to the teams and drivers, and I'm only going to quickly go over the drivers who have been full-time this year, whilst I will spend more time on the changes driver-wise for the final three races. Penske keep its usual lineup of Joseph Newgarden, Scott McLaughlin, Will Power, who, whenever I say his name, people still chuckle, and Simon Pagano, whose driving future is uncertain after this year. Chip Ganassi still has one of the surprises of the season, Marcus Ericsson. Scott Dixon, rising star Alex Palau, and someone who has shown constant improvement this year, seven-time NASCAR Cup champion, Jimmy Johnson. Andretti Autosport, along with the Curb Agajanian and Steinbrenner side operations, still have Alexander Rossi, Ryan hunter Ray, whose future is also uncertain, Colton Herter, and popular Canadian James Hinchcliffe. On to Arrow McLaren Schmidt Peterson, who still have its pair of the championship leader at the moment, Pato Award or Patricio Award, and someone who hopes to get some more positive momentum built up, the number seven of Felix Rosenquist. Ed Carpenter has Connor Daly, who's hoping the US Air Force keeps the funding for him to race in the seat, and Rena Spike, whose early season form has dropped somewhat. Meanwhile, Carlin returned with Max Chilton and apparently have plans of expanding to two cars next year. Now here's where the changes are at. Not for the two drivers of Rahal Letterman Lanigan, Graham Rahal and Takuma Sato, but with the number 45 car, which for the last three races will now be driven by 2019 Indy Lights champion and a McLaren IndyCar driver last season, Oliver Askew. With Rahal fielding a third car full-time next season, the team have, throughout this season, tried out drivers to analyse who would work. Santino Ferrucci and Christian Lungard have been in the seat before, and Oliver will be hoping to make an impact in these last three races. Of the good kind, of course. Mayor Shank will end the season with Jack Harvey, who will be saying goodbye to the team after this season, and Elio Cascianeves, who will be competing in these last three races after winning an event this year called the Indy 500 for the fourth time, apparently. AJ Foyt finished the year by adding a third car for just the last event at Long Beach. Joining the regulars of Sebastian Bourdais and Dalton Kellett is Charlie Kimball, who's once again giving the distinctive Tracee livery another run as he hopes to return to full-time driving next year. Dale Coyne at the moment has still got Ed Jones in the Vassar Sullivan entry, whilst Grosjean has been a revelation in the Wick Rare partnered car, but we also might get a second Rick Ware entered car, but at the moment no news has come to say that they plan on competing in these races. There is every chance that they might, so I'll leave an asterisk on this entry. Finally, we have a new entry for this season, but not new to IndyCar. Puncos Racing return with former Williams F1 shareholder Brad Hollinger, now part of the ownership of the team, and will compete in the full season next year, but will use these last three races to get acclimatised for next year. 
For all three races, they have 2020 Formula 2 runner-up and highly touted Ferrari F1 test driver Callum Eilert. It will be really intriguing to see how he, and indeed the team, perform, but we know Hunkos have the capability of major upsets, and indeed with Callum behind the wheel, anything is possible for this fan favourite team. Well, as these are the last few races, we might as well take a look at the top 10 in the championship standings. Pato Ward is your championship leader with three races remaining, with Alex Palau behind, only by 10 points, but on the back foot after two DNFs at Indy Road Course and Gateway. And he also hasn't raced on any of the tracks we're now about to go on. Third place Joseph Newgarden has, but he's actually qualified not too well for the Portland race today. And anyone below him is going to need a lot to try and get anything close to altering the championship picture. But they can alter the picture for the drivers who are within a shout. Because these guys, and well, mainly from a perspective of how competitive IndyCar is, could easily alter the perspective of who does win the championship. Also, whilst we are at it, the races take place today on Sunday the 12th, next weekend on Sunday the 19th, and the weekend after on, yep, you guessed it, Sunday the 26th. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and that you've gotten a clearer idea of what IndyCar's unintentional West Coast Swing is all about. Although this video did descend into talking about the final stretch to the IndyCar Championship, but still. If you liked any of the pictures that were shown, even though I've heavily cropped them, then all the credits are at the bottom of the screen, so you can have these pictures as the background photo on your desktop, on whatever device you are watching this on. Also, whilst we are at it, then I just want to say a massive thanks to the response on my previous video about the Le Mans. I was not quite expecting anything close to that level of reception. I'm quite amazed to be honest, um, but if I have been able to help people with the video and I guess subsequently this video that I'm doing now, then I'm glad and I'm glad that it's being received well, so once again thank you very much for this mind-boggling response and I massively appreciate the response, it's always very nice to see. Uh, but either way, thank you very much for watching this video and until the next one, enjoy the rest of your day.